really happy to be here. Um, we had a really great episode of Who Do You Think You Are tonight with Zoe Deschanel. Did I say it right, Terry? Yes. Okay, great. Terry is my co-host this evening. She's going to be my cameraman and my behind-the-scenes gal. Her picture is frozen, so you won't see her move at all. At least she's not sticking her tongue out or anything at you guys. Um, and then we have two panelists with us this evening. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves, Tammy, if you want to go ahead and start. Sure, absolutely. I'm Tammy Hepps. I am the founder of Treelines.com, which is a new website for sharing family stories. And some of the family stories that we've been sharing this month include recaps of the Who Do You Think You Are episodes. So my, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, and I have family all in the Northeast. So as we'll get to, Lancaster is actually one of the towns in my family, and it was really great for me to learn so much history about a place that I spent so much time but had no idea what was right around the corner. Oh, that's excellent, yeah. Um, and I actually, Terry and Tammy and I met at the National Genealogical Society Conference in Las Vegas last May, and she's wonderful, and her site is awesome, and so everybody should go check it out. It's treelines.com, and it's amazing. It's a fantastic website, so um, I'll go ahead and stop singing your praises now. Uh, <laughs> um, Shan <laughs> yeah, right? Shannon, do you want to introduce yourselves for us? Hi, I'm Shannon Bennett. I write Trials and Tribulations of a Self-Taught Family Historian. Um, I've just been doing genealogy for a few years. I started out as the second Family Tree first blogger for Family Tree University in 2011. Um, and besides that, I'm just having a fun time checking out my family tree. <laughs> you want to go ahead and give the Family Tree University a little pitch because I know their online conference is coming up soon. Yes, it is. Um, weekend of September 13th, Family Tree University will be having their fall virtual conference. Um, for those of you who have never heard of it or are not familiar with it, it is a completely online three-day conference where you have access to 15 lectures by various genealogy experts. There are also live chats, a forum and discussion board that happens all weekend, and you get a goodie bag. <laughs> Goodie bags are always fun. Everybody yeah. likes their swag. Yeah. Well, great. So, um, and then Terry, do you want to do a little introduction or say anything else? Uh oh, did we lose volume on Terry? Okay. Well, hopefully, if you can hear me, Terry. Um, send me a text or something so I know what's going on. All right, so let's just get started. This is quite an interesting episode. I learned a ton about Quakers. I don't have any Quakers in my family. I've never researched them, so that was, it was quite interesting for me. Uh, I also have never really heard of Zoe before, to be quite honest. I don't watch a lot of TV, so this it was interesting to see her reactions because to me she wasn't really a celebrity because I don't know her other work. Um, so it was kind of neat just to see her as a person instead of somebody I've seen on the movies or something else. Um, what did you guys think about that as, in terms of her emotional reaction and the way she handled the information that was coming at her? Who well, wants to start? I... <laughs> go on. <laughs> Shannon, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to say I'm familiar with her work, but it is always fun to watch a show on Who Do You Think You Are when you're not really familiar with the actor, because it's always the person's story that I'm interested in to begin with. Yeah. Um, and it was quite a story, I have to say. Um, I did learn a lot about that area of Pennsylvania. I have family from Pennsylvania, um, no Quakers that I'm aware of yet. But um, I liked hearing the history and how they wound it through with her family story to really give her a compact package. Yeah. And Tammy, what did you think? You know, I, I love the angle that she, that she came at it with. I mean, for her, it was a story. She, you know, started off by saying how proud she was to be a feminist and how in her own work, outside of being an actress, that she did a lot to try to, you know, empower young women. So it was clear that coming into this story and knowing a little bit about what she was going to get, that she was really enthusiastic to hear about a female forebear and part of a society that had equality for men and women at such an early date that it was just this natural thing that they should have six men and six women signing on to that letter mm -hmm. and such a natural thing that the mother and the two daughters should take such a you know, strong hand in sort of the dangerous operation you know, at the end of the riots. Mm -hmm. It was clear that it meant something to her personally. And that already in her life she was carrying through those values in some way, and now she really understood where they came from and how it was that she came to be who she is. So I really like that aspect of it. 
Yeah, and I thought it was interesting even in some of the documentation that she was reading out loud, um, some of the records that she had access to, you know, the quotes that, that struck me were the best and most capable woman I ever knew. That was towards the end. Um, and I just think that really hits on what you were just talking about, Tammy, that it's just that connection with that feminist side of her and that strong, powerful woman. I actually right now am writing an article about... Um, the women's suffrage movement in the 19, you know, when it passed in 1920. And so it, all of this is kind of coming together for me this week. It's been a very powerful women's movement style week for me. <laughs> Good week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are worse things that I could do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about um, Zoe herself. I'm curious, has anybody ever seen her Hello Giggles website that she mentioned right at the beginning? Have you guys ever seen that? I've never heard of it before. So, are you curious about it at all? I am a little. I haven't gone out there yet. <laughs> <laughs> if I weren't doing this, I would have gone on there now. But uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I'll look afterwards. We'll look after we're done. Very good. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if anybody out there in the audience, if you want to send a message through YouTube or Twitter, um, please do so if you have any feedback about that Hello Giggles website or if you have a chance to look it up for us and, and let us know what it's like. I'd be interested in hearing your input out there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this Quaker perspective. I know um, both of you have family in that area or had some family in that area. Can you touch on that a little bit in terms of that corner of the world? I mean, it's a beautiful area out there, as you as you saw, just these beautiful landscapes that she was driving through throughout the episode. Um, I sort of, in a way, know much more about the Amish presence out there, which mm -hmm. is you know, still very strong to this day, and a lot of people who go there tend to do the sort of touristy activities related to the Amish, which is mostly what I did when I was out there when I wasn't doing family-related things. But it's... Right. Beautiful. There's still a strong farming community there, so in some ways, you know, there are, there are parts of it that still feel probably like what they felt like when the Palmerals were there and all of this history was being made. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really just lovely. I mean, the Quaker part of it is not really part of my family history. I have some cousins who who became Quakers now, um, so through them, I've seen a little bit about what Quakerism is in the modern times. But of course, the ideals that they have you know, almost fit in now to be a pacifist, to be a feminist. These things are not mm -hmm. as uncommon now, whereas as we saw 150 years ago, it was just plain dangerous to live your, your life that way. So I don't think I ever appreciated how revolutionary the, the Quaker religion was until I saw it in the context of the history in this episode. I just had no idea. Actually, yeah, I think that's a really good way to say it. They really were revolutionaries. Um, but you're, you're right. I never would have described them that way before tonight. No, Definitely I not. much more about the, the pacifist aspect of it and less that their commitment to equal rights, especially when it came to slavery, as much as they were pacifists, it also put them very much on the front lines of the violence that was going on in the country at that time. Yeah, yeah. an interesting place for them to be as right. pacifists. <laughs> Shannon, what, what's your take on um, just anything in general in terms of the northeast corner of the country and the Quakers and what did you walk away with tonight? I did find that it was interesting um, how even though they were pacifists, they were still willing to put themselves in harm's way and in danger more than once. Um, they could have been beaten, they could have been killed, they, number, numerous things could have happened to them just by helping others who they thought had the exact same rights that they did. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few friends who are Quakers and it's amazing to see to me how that trait hasn't really changed in them. They still are very vocal on their opinions, will stand up for what they think is right. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if that is passed down to them through their family histories. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. I kind of like that too. Hmm. Terry, it looks like your camera is working again. Can you talk? Yay, look at that. I can Yay, do it. Yay, Terry's <laughs> back. That's exciting. I wonder what stopped it. That's crazy. Yeah, I don't who knows. So Terry, tell us a little bit what what did you think of tonight's episode? Um, you know, Tammy really said it well. You really didn't think about them in in the terms of revolutionaries and tonight's episode really just brought it all to life. 
Mm-hmm. And do you have any family up there? I can't remember for sure, Terry. Um, I have Pennsylvania family. I couldn't tell you specifically where in Pennsylvania. It's not a line I've spent a lot of time on. Um, definitely no Quakers. Yeah. So let's change it up a little bit. Um, one of the things that they highlighted specifically in terms of the history for this story was the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. And I thought the record that they pulled out from the committee was absolutely fascinating. The quote yeah. that I caught was, the evil has been in steadily increasing. And then this 1850 law comes into place. Talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about slavery, slave research. How, do you have any experience in that direction? What do you think? I have to say that bringing in historical facts like that, which a lot of people don't understand what exactly was happening in the United States at that time. I mean, a lot of people know about the Civil War and the Emancipation mm-hmm. Proclamation, but there seems to be a real gap in the education of what events led up to that? You know, why did we go to war? Mm -hmm. Why did people feel this way? And to show her that and bring in that history, I think really added to the story. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Tammy? Yeah, no, I I thought you made a great point. I mean, we know so much about how the Civil War got started, I mean, the immediate proximate events. Mm -hmm. We know so much about, you know, Abraham Lincoln's role in the Emancipation Proclamation, and not just because of that movie that came out at the end of last year, but of course because I had the same subpar, you know, history classes that you might have had. Um, You know, these these earlier events, you know, it's, it's amazing. And of course, you know, that big shocker that this was something that influenced John Wilkes Booth, I mean, you know, you couldn't script yeah. it better that these little things that get lost in the larger sweep of history, that those are the things that motivate people. This mm-hmm. riot that might have never mentioned more than like a sentence or two in our textbooks, that that was something that was really, really personal for the people who were involved and personal mm-hmm. enough that it added to his, you know, injuries, you know, related to his perspective on slavery. And one of the things that motivated him to to do what he did. I mean, that was just incredible. You could not have sort of stated the case better for how these small little historical details end up having a, an outsized impact, but we but we lose it over time. And you know, this episode brought it back for us in a really meaningful way. Yeah, I actually I would agree 100% with that. Um, it, in my own research, I've been looking a lot at the Kansas-Missouri border wars leading up to the Civil War, and of course that was um, a huge had a huge impact as well in, in leading to the war. And I had an ancestor who lived right there on almost on the border itself, and he ended up being a Union veteran, but he lived in Missouri, and so it was this very convoluted kind of situation to research. But it definitely brings to light all those little tiny events that come across that you may otherwise miss. Terry, yeah. did you have any input on the on any of that, the, the 1850 yeah. Act and the slavery aspect? And No, I, you, you know, you guys really hit it all well. And I really think when they dig in and they really tell how that history affects each individual person, such as Booth. I mean, when they said Booth, my mouth dropped. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I really, when you look at things now, especially as genealogists, you really have a different look at the history that you learned in school, you know? Mm-hmm. And going back, I always feel like, you know, I, I had a private school education all my life. And I think about the amount of money my parents put into that, and then I think, what a waste. <laughs> because we didn't get everything, you know? And I've talked right. to teachers, and they laugh, and they're like, there really isn't time to, to go over everything. I'm like, but do you miss such big events and big things that lead up to it. So I really thought that that was really, it's key. It's very important to what's going on. Mm-hmm. Right. And I actually today discovered a page through the Library of Congress where they have teacher's guides for some of these events. And it includes some of the smaller, more unheard of moments in American history, which I thought was kind of cool. So I sent the link to all my teacher friends because I'm not a teacher. Um, (laughs) So let's move to the Underground Railroad portion a little bit. Has anybody researched Underground Railroad related events before? Any connection Mm -hmm. with that? 
Uh, for me, not the Underground Railroad. I, I had looked at um, some ads from a slightly earlier period that people would put in the paper looking for, you know, the runaway slaves. Mm. And so it was before it was before that that act kind of changed everything. It was a different climate, obviously, before that act got passed. As the episode explained really well, but even just reading the ads that people would put in the paper and the fines they were offering, I mean, it's it's just chilling to think that. And also, in most cases, they they were able to enlist the help of people and get their slaves back. So of course, now you pass this act, and then it becomes illegal not to to help them. It becomes right. illegal. No, sorry, not to help the slave owners. It's illegal to help the, the slaves who are freeing. I mean, I guess I never really thought about just how dramatically that changed everything until until they made it clear just how many people were arrested, how many people were convicted, how many people were put back into slavery, how many people were basically, you know, free African Americans who were picked up and dragged back down mm -hmm. to the South even though they had their papers. So this right. is something I've seen a lot more of in Henry Louis Gates's Theories, you know, similar to who you think you are, but focusing on African American lives. Yeah. And I never really quite understood in context until this episode really brought to life just the amount of, you know, violence and danger that there was for, for anybody who was involved in this in, in any in any way remotely. Mm -hmm. But do you also think that's because history is written by the victors and a lot of that could be glossed over? And what's and what's glossed over by? Well, I mean, I mean. Um, we won, so why do we talk about all the nasty stuff if we don't have to? Because well, I, I found by digging further and reading obscure books, you find a lot more about American history. So is it a, a fault of the mainstream education that we're not getting it? It was a pretty ugly time. I mean, I guess that's yeah. what I realized. And, 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 and Zoe actually made a really good point when she said, Wow, I mean, the laws that the government passed were truly reprehensible. The fact that most people kind of just went along with it, and it only was this very small group that said, "Wait a minute, here we were already doing something that wasn't okay, and now this is really not okay." Right. Now, although we won the war, I think what it took to get there, in some ways, was clearly a lot more shameful than certainly I ever realized. So, you know, it's one of those things, like the Dred Scott decision, where I guess you know we teach it, but we don't teach it too much because. We don't look too good in the process. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It took, right. A, it took a long time for clearly for right to prevail and and generations of, of families that, that suffered as a result. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you missed the point. Yeah, it's interesting. I've actually just um, been doing some local research on a gentleman that lived here in my town. And he was a mulatto. His father was um, the plantation owner and his mother was a slave. He was born in Virginia and he escaped on the Underground Railroad. And he ended up in Colorado. But before that he was in Chicago and he and his wife and his brother-in-law were heavily involved in the Underground Railroad. Uh, and he talks a lot, or the biographers I guess, talk a lot about how his involvement impacted them as a family and the repercussions mm -hmm. of that on, on their businesses and, and on them socially um, when kind of it got to be known. Um, it's just, it's, it's fascinating reading and it really, you know, before he was in Chicago, he lived in um, South America and at the time um, African Americans or, or I guess Africans at that point were um, free. They, there was no slavery in South America when he was there. So it's really interesting to read through how this man goes from slavery to escaped slave who's afraid all the time and looking over his shoulder to then South America where he has certain freedoms but he's still hoping nobody recognizes him as they come off the boats um, through as they go through the country and then back to Chicago where he's once again on that edge someone could recognize him but he's been gone for a while so they probably won't but then he's underground railroad it's just this I mean it really puts personality into it and it really gives some uh, emotional effect to it um, so it's just been interesting reading his name was Barney Ford and he actually had quite a bit to do with Colorado state history ultimately so he's an interesting fella you know, as you're talking, it reminds me of something from that, that other series that I, I mentioned. I remember that a family that, that came up, um, evidently the, the 
freed ancestor, the freed ancestor of the person on the show, so the, the freed slave bought him, his kids, bought his wife, basically so, because the system was so broken mm -hmm. that they had to buy their own family because, I mean, this is again a little bit for the Fugitive Slave Act, but that was the only way for them to be sure that their right. family was freed, free because they were owned, <laughs> but right. owned by, you know, their father slash husband. Yeah. So, I mean, just as you were, you were saying about the, the man that you were mentioning, I mean, this, the, clearly the things that people had to do in their lives, which you know, in some ways are largely unrecorded because the nature of their circumstances was that they weren't writing their own histories as much as people involved in other aspects of it. You know, just these crazy stories, little that survives, you just lives like we could never even imagine yeah. in, in what we live in today. Yeah, yeah, and it, there's another story for regionally here of a woman named Clara Brown. She was theoretically the first black woman to cross the plains and come to Colorado during the gold rush and she opened a laundry service and she made enough money washing miners clothes to be able to go back to the plantation more than once and purchase slaves. She was looking for her family and yeah. she ultimately brought back numerous other slaves that she would purchase and, and bring back on a wagon, mostly women, and set them free in the mountains of Colorado. Oh wow. wow. So just some really <laughs> incredible stories that come out of this. And again, they're all, you know, I mean, unless you are a high school student or a, a student in the Colorado public school system, you probably would never hear about either of those people. Yeah. So, because it's not taught anywhere else, right? So, yeah, it's just interesting. It goes back to that, you know, education piece that we were talking about earlier. You know, are we, um, are we really doing right by our children in the public school system? That's a whole other debate. We won't get into that. But <laughs> <laughs> what else could we talk about in history class that might engage the next generation? And there's my pitch for the next gen um, genealogical network. There you go. <laughs> Which we're all proud members of, right? Um, <laughs> So um, I did notice, of course, and I think s several other people did too on Twitter, the Chris Christiana resistance that was such a major event in Zoe's ancestors' lives occurred on September 11th of 1851. And of course, September 11th is quite a date for us in American history. Terry was actually the one who pointed it out first. She heard it first, so I'll give her credit for that. Um, but I tweeted it. Um, <laughs> so what do we think about that? Is that coincidence or is that, an, is that too much to think that it's coincidence? Hmm. Look, it's obvious, I think it's obviously coincidence, but it, you know, it was like a punch in the gut that the 150th anniversary of this major event that I never really knew about before this episode <laughs> happened on, on such a day. I mean, I, I was yeah. living in city at the time. Mm. Um, as soon as I heard that date, like I said, I, it was really, I mean, that was second to the moment where they mentioned John Wilkes Booth, like my jaw kind of dropping in the episode of, right. you, know, you want to find a way to tie it together. I think that's a dangerous slope to go on because depending upon where you're on the political uh, spectrum, you could or could not say that our government or is or is not, you know, so I, I hesitate to go in that direction, but <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I hesitate a lot. But, you know, you, you can't help but your mind can't help but go there. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's exactly it, Tammy. You can't help but make those, you know, connect those two points and make a line. Um, Shannon, what did you think about that? How did that impact you? <laughs> um, it's, it's an unfortunate coincidence, I have to say. Um, I think those of us who remember September 11th will always have a little bit of a gut reaction whenever we see that date again. Um, unfortunately for me, my husband was working in Manhattan and mm. it, it has a different impact for us because lots of emotions around that time. So whenever I see a coincidence in a family record or a history I'm reading, it always brings me back to that day, which I do agree is a slippery slope because we can't necessarily draw a conclusion that one is greater than the other. Oh, yeah. Um, but it is an amazing coincidence that 150 years later um, we're standing up for something again. Yeah. Yeah, there's a blog post in there somewhere for someone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think for sure, maybe for all of us. Maybe. 
That's interesting. So, um, all right. So we'll we'll change the subject a little bit. Talk about John Wilkes Booth and what you thought when you, besides your jaw dropping. I found it funny. Um, there's a little bit of a of a family connection sort of, to John Wilkes Booth <laughs> on my side of the family. Um, my mother's family is from Port Tobacco, Maryland, which is where the conspiracy was hatched. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm lucky my oldest son wasn't awake because he would have gone, Mom, Port Tobacco, isn't that where our family is from? Isn't that where John Wilkes Booth did this? Um, <laughs> So it, it was interesting, and I always find those little connections when you can bring something completely unexpected into the picture. It just makes the story so much better. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Tammy? You know, it, it was just one of those things. I mean, again, if I weren't doing this, I'd be furiously Googling <laughs> Wikipedia, like <laughs> the larger scope of, of John Wilkes Booth's life. I mean, clearly it wasn't just the Christiana riots, and clearly it you know wasn't just you know the, the few other things I recall about him from again my poor history education. But um, you know, again, back to sort of drawing lines, I wanted I want to be able to connect the dots a little bit more to understand. You know, yes, he was friends with them. You know, what did it mean? What did he really know about it? Did that directly inspire him to do what he did next? Oops. <laughs> he happened to not just disappear off the world stage for, you know, the next 15 years before he did what he did. Um, but, you know, it makes me think of those little bits and pieces that I found out about my own ancestors where it's the same kind of thing. Like, suddenly you can put them in a place in history and connect them to something. But, you know, I want to do a lot more digging, both for him as well as for the same kinds of things for my own ancestors that I'm researching to figure out, you know, not just that he knew the family, but exactly how did it, that did it affect him. Because I'm sure there were lots of other people who, who knew that family and they didn't all, you know, go to Fort Peter on that paper like <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, let's talk about that a little bit. And, and both of you have kind of mentioned connecting the dots a little bit more and, and, and reading more and learning more about this story. How many people do you think in mainstream society watch Who Do You Think You Are and then go to Wikipedia and look up <laughs> John Wilkes Booth or um, Quaker research? I mean, it, it, is the show really helping people get into genealogy? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> it would make our lives so much easier. No doubt. <laughs> if only um, we can for the commercial space for our own sites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, TLC, are you listening? We'd like a commercial <laughs> spot. <laughs> Um, I seriously hope so, um, because I understand, you know, it's going to be a new audience with TLC. Might not be all genealogy people and history people, but hopefully a spark has been struck in them somewhere where they want to learn a little bit more and they want to be able maybe to connect with their favorite star, and so that will start them down the path and then they can learn more and maybe be interested in seeing if they had have any connections with those people themselves. Yeah, you know, my feeling is, and this comes from my, you know, my own sort of research that I've done, you know, we've got a lot of branches in our family and they only focus on one in that episode, so it sort of gives you a kind of false sense of what it can be if you really, really get into it the way that we have. But the truth is, I think every family, go down the branch, somewhere you're going to get some kind of story like what they feature on the episode that's going to just change how you see yourself and your family and, and, and how you, you know, came to be who you are in the circumstances that you're in. So if nothing else, I hope that people kind of read the episodes and, okay, they're not, like, obsessively Googling John Wilkes Booth. Maybe we're the only dorks who can <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be at least one or two more out there somewhere. <laughs> well, and they think, like, you know, Zoe Deschanel, she had heard that name, you know, of Sarah Henderson before. That was not unknown to her. She had just never actually bothered to do the work mm -hmm. or even knew how to get started to do the work. So if nothing else, I hope that people who have their own sort of equivalent of the Sarah Henderson moments as they're watching the episodes think, okay, I watch the commercial, I know I go to Ancestry.com, you know, <laughs> whatever it, it may be, that they, they sort of sort of dip the toe into the water and see that actually 
you can find some amazing stuff without necessarily having to do, do what people do on the show and go all over the country and all these, you know, obscure libraries and specialized historians. You know, you really don't need all of that to make really great discoveries in most cases. So that's the part that I hope that people take with them, if nothing else, after they watch the episodes. Do you think that this is a reasonable introduction to genealogy as a hobby? You know, some of the episodes are and some of them are not. I mean, this one was like serious, serious research. I mean, you know, there was no, let's type in on Ancestry.com. I mean, they had the one moment where he owned, he owned the slave and then everything else were, you know, it's difficult research, I think, for the average person to do, to know where those libraries are, to know what those records are, to make an appointment if you don't have a camera crew and a producer. <laughs> make <laughs> right, just getting the clerk on the phone. <laughs> exactly. so, so this is probably not, you know, the most representative episode, but I feel like the, you know, the Kelly Clarkson episode where she, uh, she was able to find a lot more using records online or some of the news, newspaper research that we saw two episodes ago with Christina Applegate. I mean, all of that was internet research. That's you know, like you know, the basics of of, of what we do and the kinds of things that you you too can do from home. <laughs> the kinds of episodes I think are probably more inspiring because a person could sit and think, oh, okay, I can Google that the same as they did on the show. You know, sure. most of us don't have the time and the money to fly to wherever it was that our ancestors came from and and repeat the real journey that people get to go on, like. Like last episode where they went to Germany. I mean, that's that's a serious trip that people save and plan for years if they're gonna if they're gonna do it themselves. On the other hand, it's nice to see that they start out with the family, you know, and that's the way a lot of journeys begin for genealogists and family historians and people who want to know more about their past. You know, sitting around the the dinner table telling stories and wondering. Is there any truth to what Grandma just told me? Um, can I go and find that information out? So I do like how they start out with each person talking to a family member and really sharing the stories to start them out on their journey. That I hope people can connect with on a larger scale. Yeah. Terry, what do you think? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling Jamie brought up, you had that look. <laughs> Jamie brought up some good points. She, she brought up how, you know, like on this one, there really wasn't a lot of going to ancestry.com and, you know, typing in grandma's name. Whereas Kelly Clarkson, you know, you've seen them do that. That's how they started their journey. But do you think that TLC is really taking a step back and showing the public that yeah. it's not all online? You have to go outside the house as well. Mm -hmm. Well, look, that's a great start online. You can start building the tree, but a lot of the stories, they're going to be elsewhere. A lot of the wonderful things that you can find can only be found in archives. Um, last spring, a year ago this last March, I went to the National Archives with my mother-in-law, and we were looking at a Civil War pension file, and I found a photograph of my husband's fourth great-grandfather in awesome. his pension yeah. file. I would have never been able to find it if I had not gone to those archives. Right. Yeah. One of my uh, yeah, one of my favorite genealogy trips with my father the first time that we went to Pittsburgh, which is where he grew up and where a lot of my sort of family history was for that branch of the family who first came over to Homestead, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. And if you remember your history, you may remember the steel mill riots that happened there right around the time that my ancestors were arriving. Um, my great-grandfather was one of the people who founded the synagogue in, in Homestead. And I actually found an archive there that when the synagogue was closed down in, in, in 1992, 100 years after the Homestead steel mill riots, uh, they had lovingly preserved all the records of the synagogue and they were in an archive in the Heinz History Center and it was 16 boxes of information wow. and I was probably the first person who unwrapped those files the day that they were packed up and there on the very first page my father and I are sitting together we open up the first page of the first book and there is the signature of my grandfather and his name is on every page you know because he was the secretary of the treasurer signing off on you know people's expenses they bought you know wine for after services and you know they they bought matzah for Passover whatever it was <laughs> yeah. but, the, but the amazing thing that was there that Otherwise, if I had never found it, it would have been completely gone. There was a very long handwritten history of the synagogue that detailed person by person, event by event, 
how it went from just a few Jewish people in that town to forming a synagogue, to a synagogue that became a larger community. And my father and I were just stunned at what was there as we're reading this together. And it's written in that you know, lovely language that people you know, wrote in 100 years ago. I had the same thought as I was listening, you know, to her read selections from that pamphlet that her ancestors signed her name to. We don't just we don't write the way that our ancestors did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I would have never actually gone and taken that trip and taken the trouble to call that library and drag my father all the way across Pennsylvania to go and see that if I hadn't gotten really into it based on the the internet research that I that I did on ancestry and other sites. But you're absolutely right. That moment of looking at those records and knowing that my grandfather had held, great grandfather had held that book and signed those pages and, you know, wrapped up the ledgers and put them back on the shelf at the end of the day. I mean, that was just an amazing, amazing moment for my father and I. I mean, that was worth <laughs> every hour, and it was many hours. That, that we <laughs> yeah. There. You're absolutely right, Terry. I mean, it doesn't end at the internet. You just need to get that burst of inspiration by finding the easy stuff to go after the hard stuff, which of course is the real reward. Yeah. Wow. Those are great stories. So thanks both of you for sharing with those, sharing those with us. That's awesome. Um, well, there, there's also something to be said for looking at the original. You know, you look at everything online. It's all it's black and white. It's black and white. It's black and white. I have a blog post I wrote a couple years ago, and it had, I think it's like draft cards or something, and I have the original. Wow. And I scanned it and, of course, attached it to the post, and the comments were, oh, my God, I didn't know it was red. You know, oh. all the writing was red, all the pre-printed stuff. So yes. there's something for seeing the original, what, you know, the coloring of it. And, you know, of course we know there's something in holding the original, but just to see the different colors that are actually out there mm -hmm. and, and what they were using. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Gives a little bit to it. No, <laughs> it I, I it totally agree. It yeah, you're right, more. Shannon. It makes it more real. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Holding something in your hand, there's a piece to that. That's an emotional connection because you know that they held it too yeah. at some point for mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of those materials. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something that you can never replace by right. searching on Google. Mm -hmm. I happen to have, um, if you've watched our show before, you probably know about Oscar. Um, if you read my blog, you know about Oscar. <laughs> he's my brick wall. Um, and he's my third great grandfather. And I have his original homestead certificate from right after the Civil War. And yeah, that's an incredible piece for me to hold. Um, but it's also true in what you were saying, Terry, about the red ink and the way that they were writing um, and mm -hmm. the font even that they used right. instead of seeing it transcribed on the internet mm -hmm. on a black and white page. So, right. yeah, I think that's all really interesting. Um, so let's, gosh, I had this great thing I was going to ask and then I got sidetracked by Oscar. I always get sidetracked <laughs> by Oscar. It's just not fair. <laughs> it's like he won't leave me alone. Um, so let's do, we brought up some really good points and I think some of this has been really interesting discussion. So let's, let's kind of continue in this vein a little bit. There's some really easy, low-hanging fruit that's out there on the internet, but there's all sorts of people out there who will tell you that you shouldn't start on the internet. But for those of us in our age range, because we are all, all very similar of age, I think, um, at least we look it, um, <laughs> it's very natural for us to start by going to Google or YouTube. Um, we're all fairly tech savvy, especially our app developer there in the middle. Um, so that's a natural thing for us to go to the internet first. I mean, it, when you need a recipe for dinner, I look at my phone. I look at an app. The cookbook is almost the last thing I grab. So, <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting there following along on my laptop or my phone to cook this recipe. Thanksgiving dinner, I had my laptop and I had my entire menu on OneNote for Thanksgiving dinner. So. Is it, is it a sin, shall I say, is it a sin that you start on the internet or should all new genealogists be encouraged to start in a library or in an archives or, you know, beyond the, the sit down with the family members and the oral conversations? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, Ready, set, go. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the internet and the digital archives and the accessibility to records. Um, when I started doing genealogy, my son was in fourth grade and he came home with a genealogy project. Mm. You had to list, he had to list to his great grandparents. 
Well, I can go back several, several, several generations, and it bugged me that my husband couldn't. And occasionally, I get like a dog with a bone, and I just won't let it go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my youngest wasn't even, he just started preschool, maybe. As a stay-at-home mom to two small children, I don't have the luxury of leaving my house as often as a lot of people, especially the community, the genealogy part of the community who are retirees. Um, I had to work around nap times and yeah, bus oh, pickup schedule. Oh, I know that schedule. real well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if it wasn't for the accessibility to at least get me started, I mean, I realized having a passion for research and history in my background um, that I would eventually have to leave my house. <laughs> um, but get out of the jammies. <laughs> yeah, out of the yoga pants and the t-shirt with the fuzzy blue slippers. Right. I have to leave the house, darn it. But at least I could do a good four or five months of just preliminary work. And I could set up goals for myself where in the future I need to go to XYZ archive. I need to right. travel to this state. I need to call this clerk. Um, but if it wasn't for the internet, I wouldn't be here. I would have had to wait a few more years till they were older. Mm -hmm. I'll ditto that because, yeah, my mm -hmm. very first search was guess what about Oscar's family and it was on the internet way back after I graduated from college when the internet was still fairly new <laughs> and my dad was confused by it and actually said the new fangled World Wide Web uh, <laughs> when he asked me to, to do a lookup and I was hooked ever since I found them within an hour um, so yeah it yeah, I'll agree. Tammy? <laughs> I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm giving a talk at Roots Tech this year, which is at the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. It's called um, Top 10 Things I Learned About My Family History While Sitting on My Couch. Oh, and fantastic. <laughs> and I, you know, I won't give too many previews except to say that story about my great-grandfather is a story that began on my couch. Not only did I find the basic census records and things on Ancestry, but when I started Googling his name, that's how I found out that there were these records mm -hmm. in the archives in, in Pittsburgh. Now, close to 10 years passed from when I found that, actually no, more like seven years passed from when I first found out that those records were there from when I actually was able to do the trip because I had to take days off and I needed my father to come with me so we had to coordinate with his schedule. So it took a while to make that trip happen, but I found the finding aid for those records in the archives on the internet. And the truth is I didn't know whether or not I was going to find anything about my great-grandfather in there. I sure expected that I would because I knew he'd been so instr instrumental in the history, but I had no idea. So, you know, I have nine more things for my talk. I've given you a preview for one <laughs> You know, obviously, I wouldn't be giving a talk like that if I didn't really feel like, you know, in this day and age, I think the best kind of research begins on the Internet because it's the biggest way to cast a really wide net, get a general sense of what's out there, find the easy-to-find records as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. trace the outlines of the person's life, and that's how you figure out, like Zoe, like Zoe did, oh, okay, I need to go to Philadelphia to see the Quaker archive there. Mm -hmm. Or I need to drive down to the State House of Georgia, like Kelly Clarkson, because now I know that my ancestor, you know, was a state senator there, and that's where those records would be. So I almost feel like if you're going to, you know, only look at it the old-fashioned way, where you, you know, you go to the archives in person, and you're always looking up those records manually, you're, you're just slowing yourself down. And look, we've all got brick walls. You know, you've got your, your Oscar. I've got my Davis family who drives me nuts. <laughs> I mean, that's no fun. But, you know, the... The, the easiest way to sort of figure out, um, you know, what the possibilities are in the little time that we have is to get started online, and then obviously, you know, don't stop there. You're making a mistake if you stop there. But, yeah. you know, like you, you know, I have my own constraints in my personal life that I can't just go and do these trips. And, um, you know, I feel like it makes sense for, for everybody, and there's a reason why technology exists, you know. We take it with a double-edged sword sometimes, but it sure makes a lot of things you know, a lot easier than they, than they used to be, including Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll um, go ahead and give our own pitch as well. Terry and I will also be at Roots Tech. And um, yeah. one of the reasons that um, I use the word sin when I preface all of this conversation is because our talk is actually online trees. 
are they the root of all evil? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Tammy, we'll make you a deal. You come to our talk, and we'll come to yours. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, what do you think about that? Is is internet research a sin? No. I think that, honestly, it is one good way to get somebody hooked. Here's my hook. My grandfather dies. I know nothing about his family. They, we just, we knew nothing, really. I mean, I knew his parents. I'd met them, but beyond that, really, it was nothing. And I went home and I got on the internet and I just started searching, like his surname. What can I find? What can I find? And I found an obituary for a gentleman in, um, he was in Florida, and it had a picture. I printed out two copies, brought them to my grandmother the next day, and I said, "Do you know this man?" And she laughed. She's like, oh, my God, that's your grandfather's cousin. I was like, How did you find that? I'm like, oh, my God, I was online, blah, blah, blah. I gave her the whole story. And she was like, yeah. She's like, you know, she's like, you need to write the family in West Virginia, blah, blah, blah. We just went on and on. She couldn't believe that I had found it. Now, I knew the man was related because my grandfather had big ears that kind of they stuck out. <laughs> and this guy had those ears, and you just know that it had to be the same family. So I already knew. Did us with those ears? <laughs> but she confirmed it, and that was it. I was hooked. I mean, that was my first big find, you know? So Is that when you met Ephraim, too? Is that first trip to <laughs> West Virginia? When you, I know. Yes. They're tight. <laughs> um, if, you guys are, if you're not familiar, Uncle Ephraim is a good friend of ours over at IDG, and he um, has just started to get into Twitter, and he's... <laughs> I've never actually met him in person. I've only emailed and corresponded with him, but um, he's this little old man that lives by himself in this cabin out in the woods somewhere in the mountains. And he's fantastic, and he's a hoot, but he's just starting to get into Twitter, and he's trying to chat with Terry, and he thinks that every tweet has to be directed at her. So it's actually quite humorous because the poor guy just doesn't... He just hasn't quite put it all together yet, but he's sweet as could be. Anyway, I digress. Um, so we feel have, free to tweet him at Uncle Ephraim. Yeah, yeah, at Uncle <laughs> Ephraim. He's really, really nice, and he he probably could use a few more followers. Um, all right, so I think we've had a really interesting discussion this evening, and I'm I'm very pleased that you guys were able to join us tonight. Thank you so much for popping in, especially Tammy, because we didn't invite her until I don't know maybe 15 minutes before we started. Um, so that's fantastic. I'm just um, we have about 10 minutes, maybe 15. If we stretch it, I'd like to give you both the opportunity to do some closing thoughts on the episode or any of the research aspects that came up tonight or anything really that we've talked about or give your own little pitch if you want for your <laughs> your your stuff. Um, you're more than welcome to do that. We promote our friends. So um, Shannon, would you like to start and just um, give us a little wrap up? Um, sure. Uh, obviously, it must be pretty obvious I did enjoy the episode. Um, I loved the fact that they did original records and that she was able to create such a wonderful narrative for her family history. Um, it's a goal of mine to maybe one day have something that awesome. <laughs> Um, I think I have lots of little, goal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I have lots of little bitty stories. One day they will make a, a wonderful connect the dots like One that. big giant story, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, I, go ahead. I was just going to I was gonna laugh because um, you were talking about original records, and I actually put in my notes to mention the reaction on Twitter when she took the document out of the plastic yeah. sleeve. <laughs> Did everybody <laughs> recognize that? <laughs> I yeah, thought for the our historian. I thought yeah, the, the historian's face was just yeah, it was pure <laughs> shock. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please, please continue. Oh no, no, it's <laughs> fine. Um, I have to say, I particularly enjoy the episodes where they delve into a little bit of slave history, since I've recently, about six months or so ago, in researching my own family, discovered inventories and slave records. Mm. So it's a part of my family history that I am trying to learn about and trying to figure out a little bit more on as well, um, which is a complete contrast because growing up, my grandmother and my father always told me stories about how our family left North Carolina because they were abolitionists. It's still something I'm trying to prove, 
but to hear the stories of others and how their families were affected by both of those circumstances really hits home to me and it makes me want to learn more and delve more into that type of past in my family past and into the history as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting angle for sure. That would keep me up at night. Um, <laughs> if you don't read Shannon's blog, please do. It's absolutely wonderful. I read every post. It's oh, good thanks. stuff. You're very welcome. I really do. I, I actually get that one to my inbox. I don't get very many email um, blog posts to my inbox, but that one I do. Uh, Tammy, did you want to wrap up anything? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, that, that episode took place in my backyard, as it were. I mean, I'm from Philadelphia. Lancaster is a place that is, you know, is very connected to my to my family in the present day, not mm -hmm. not so much the history, but in the present day. Like I said, I had no idea. I never even realized on a map how close Lancaster County is to the Mason-Dixon line. So for me, I mean, not only I need to go do all my Google research and kind of connect all of the dots, but also go back out there and do a completely different set of activities from what I've done every other time I've been there. Right. Part of my reaction. But the other thing which I was saying to you, Jen, on Twitter, the thing that really struck me about this episode and the reason why I enjoyed it so much is that these were people who chose to do these amazingly heroic actions. We've seen many episodes where, you know, people joined up, you know, in the Civil War or you know, or, you know, we're in a difficult marriage and tried to leave, you know, these kinds of stories where people are thrust into circumstances and they rise to the circumstances. And, you know, that's heroism too, but these were people who were living in a lovely, peaceful farming area and every decision that they made only made their lives harder and only made their lives and their families' lives more dangerous. Um, you know, we don't know whether or not she, she died because of the stress of what happened in the riots. It's, you know, it's possible. It may just be to get another another one of these coincidences that you try to make more of than is really there. But I, I just loved hearing about it because, you know, these are ancestors that we can all use as an example, even if they're not our own ancestors, people who lived in a time and were able to recognize the moral imperatives of the time in which they lived and, you know, followed their conscience, conscience and, and did really difficult and dangerous things and taught their kids to do difficult and dangerous things. Yeah. And in the name of the, you know, the greater good. So for me, it was, you know, of an episode in which I was glad not to cry because I certainly bawled at a few of them this season, but that I sort of was just really enjoying and super engaged in the whole way. I mean, it was just fascinating history and really compelling people. Thank you for that. Yeah. It yeah, I don't. I'm, there's nothing else really to say about that. Actually, um, you said it so well, Terry. What about you? Any final thoughts? Sure. After Tammy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I um, hope that we are not paired against each other for presentations at Ritz. I know. We right? are not going to have anybody in our <laughs> room. <laughs> I, know, I, know in a second. I have a lot to say on your subject. I'm just glad oh, I get a chance to raise my hand and you know put in my two cents. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I just really. Though her story is not the same as my story, I'm sure it's not the same as anybody's story, the one thing that sticks out to me week after week with this is that tracing your family, learning their stories, makes your story make sense. Mm -hmm. I've learned so much about my own family doing this that it's just it's eye-opening. Like, what can I learn? What's the next thing I'm going to learn? Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I, I just want to put it out there for all those, the newbies out there that are just beginning. It really, it's worth the while, it's worth the effort, it's worth the time. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that. And it leads me to my last question. That was a perfect segue, Terry. Thank you so much. So, did you pick anything up from this episode that is going to change the way that you are doing or conducting research today. So tomorrow when you get up, are you going to go look at something new or think of a research problem in a different way because of this episode? Hmm. <laughs> you had to ask such a tough question. I, I always, yeah, I got to finish strong, you know. <laughs> I'll say for myself, I got to spend less time on the internet and more time going after some of these archives. Like everybody else, I get so busy I put it off, I put the trips off, 
but it's really clear that perhaps some of the gems that I'm that I'm after are in these corners where yeah you got to make the effort in order to get there. So this this kind of an episode really sort of brought home to me that you know I've able to figure out a lot, but I need to be a little bit more energetic and trying to break through my my brick walls and not just keep typing the same last names into Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work for me. Oscar's last name is Brown, so uh, no Brown. Google searches for me. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I'll actually piggyback on that a little bit. I think, um, you know, this summer I started going to my local courthouse uh, once a week. I do a lot of local research and I'm doing a lot of research on our, our cemetery here in town. Um, so I've been in the courthouse once a week, almost every week all summer, and I'm going to add the historical archives for the local historical society to that list So, um, in the fall. So I, I think mm -hmm. that, yeah, getting your hands dirty is the practical experience that you'll never get at a seminar or a conference or, you know, you can take every class in the world and you can watch every webinar, but there's nothing like just going in there and, and doing it. Even if you're not searching for anything specific, like let's say you just want to find, you know, a particular uh, a quick claim deed because you've never seen one before. Just go to the courthouse and find one, you know, out of, out of all of those record sets. So, yeah, that's my two cents as well. Um, Shannon, what do you think? Are you going to change your research process tomorrow morning? Um, I definitely want to go to some of the, or at least online go, to some <laughs> of the archives um, that she talked about in Pennsylvania. I do have a line that came through Pennsylvania. They were in about that area. Um, they moved from Philadelphia across Pennsylvania eventually to Ohio and then Indiana, but they were there about the same time that all this was happening. Oh, and I'd wow. really like to find more information to see if maybe they were not necessarily involved, but um, in neighboring counties that may have had other such instances or mm -hmm. what the reactions in their communities were. And I definitely um, will make more of an opportunity in my time to go to local um, historical societies. And I have to say even public libraries because yeah. I found quite a few little gems recently in my itty bitty neighborhood library around the corner from my house that had some county collections that I didn't know about. Awesome. So make a, a concerted effort when I go out to try and see what exactly there is in my surrounding area and places mm -hmm. I'm going to visit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Terry, what about you? Um, I don't know if I'm going to necessarily change what I'm doing yet, but I'm probably going to watch the episode a couple more times because it takes me a bit to like kind of just pull everything out. And tonight I had a lot of things going on as I was watching, so I, I really need to sit down and watch it. You know, front to back, no interruptions, quiet house, and I, you know, it. I always learn something, and you make an adjustment with what you learn. So, mm -hmm. you know, but I've been spending more and more time as this year's progressed in those archives, going to different places, trying to get, um, you know, more knowledge of what's out there. So, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening for our after the show hangout on air. We're very excited and happy that you were with us. This was a fascinating conversation. Hope that uh, everybody who's watching out on the YouTube side um, enjoyed it as well. If you have any comments or feedback for Terry or myself, please uh, send us an email, find us on Facebook, get us on Twitter. We're all over social media, Google Plus, of course. <laughs> if there weren't Google Plus, we wouldn't be able to do this, so we're grateful for that. Yes. Um, and if you're interested in being a panelist in uh, for a future episode, please also shoot us a me an email or let us know. So we will be back next week after Tuesday night's next episode um, of Who Do You Think You Are, which I believe I saw was going to be Chris O'Donnell. Uh, I grew up watching Chris O'Donnell. I'm pretty excited about this one. Uh, I'm a big fan. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so this uh, it should be a good episode. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you very much, ladies, and have a wonderful evening, everybody. You too. Thanks, nice. ladies. Thanks. Good night.